Okay, this is the uh, second to last one uh, of section A force and motion. This is turning effects and forces. Um, this can be rather difficult. People find this, this quite difficult. So we're going to look at moments, um, calculate the moments of a force, see when something's balanced or not, uh, centre of gravity which is very straightforward, and then examples using a beam. That can be rather difficult. I'm going to do a very complicated version of that and then a much simpler version which, which will probably be the one that you will use but I want to show you uh, both things. So if we just look at the moment of a force, now this does start incredibly simply. So if we just remember moments, okay? The moment or turning force equals force times perpendicular distance from pivot, okay? Force times perpendicular distance from pivot. So again, if we lock this, this is measured in newtons, distance is measured in meters, so this must be measured in newton meters. Now, examples, really, really simple examples are things like spanners. So you would have, this would be very low level though, but if you have a spanner, my superbly drawn spanner, if you have a spanner um, and a nut, wow, then we could say that the turning force, if we have a spanner and say its distance is say um, 40 centimetres and that we apply a force perpendicular to the pivot of say, uh, I don't know, um, 40 newtons then we could say that the turning force on this knot is force times perpendicular distance from pivot. So the, ter the turning force, the moment, equals FD, which equals 40 times. Now, remember, it's in metres, not centimetres, so this will be 0 0.4. Apologies for my pen. Uh, 4 times 0 0.4 is 16 newton metres, okay? So the turning force here is 16 newton meters. Now that is an incredibly straightforward question. You won't get questions that straightforward typically. More likely are ones based on, uh, I'll do a simple beam. So if we consider a simple beam. Now then, the beam, which we're going to assume has no mass for now, the beam will have a length, we're saying it's got no mass. And if you've got a box on it, for example, you might say, we've got a box on this beam, and the box has a weight of, say, 20 newtons. And the box is situated, you could say, 2 metres from this, oops, from this pivot here. It's two meters away. Now that gives us a turning force. Now if we think of this beam, the force is on this side, so it will cause it to go like that. So this would be called an anti-clockwise turning force. So in this plane here, there's an anti-clockwise turning force. And the size of that anti-clockwise turning force anti-clockwise in this direction, moment equals force times distance equals 20 times 2 is 40 newton meters. So we know, quite straightforward, we know that the anti-clockwise turning force is 40 newton meters. Now if this beam is to be an equilibrium or balanced then we say, and this is very important, the sum of the anti-clockwise turning forces is equal to the sum of the clockwise turning forces in equilibrium. So that means the turning forces this way equal the turning forces this way as long as this thing is balanced and it's not moving. So for example, if you were given another force, another weight, and they said, okay, this weight is situated three meters away. And they said, what must it weigh then? So we can see 
here that we've got something here and something here and we have to find out how heavy must this be in order for this to balance. So we would say the clockwise turning force is equal to the anti-clockwise turning force so it must be equal to 40 Newton meters. So now we can say the moment is force times distance. So 40 is the moment and it equals, we don't know, times 3. So the force equals 40 divided by 3, which is 13.3 uh, Newtons. Okay? 3, 3 Newtons, whatever. So that would be the force on there, which would balance, at 3 meters, which would balance this. Okay? Now then. Something else we have to look at is the centre of gravity. Now the centre of gravity is, um, is a very straightforward experiment which you will have all done in school. It's where you take an oddly shaped object and all you do is you have to hang it from a point. So you hang it from a point and what you find is the centre of mass will always lie, because you let this thing swing, the centre of mass will always lie directly beneath it, where it lands, okay? And then if you do hang it from another point and you let it swing, you will find that the centre of mass will always lie directly beneath it. And you can do a third one if you wanted to. And what you will have found is that when you hung this object by the three different points and you did a plumb line and you drew a line underneath where, where it hung from, you'll notice that they always, always meet at the same point. And that point is the centre of gravity. The cent that is the point at which all the mass is said to act, okay? So that point there, it will perfectly balance on, okay? So everything has a centre of mass, a centre of gravity. Now when objects are designed, it's really important that they consider the centre of gravity of objects. So if you think about a candlestick, for example, a candlestick might be a heavy glass object. You might find it has a base like this. And then a light candle going up. Now that, that's because by having lots of the, of the mass distributed at the bottom, it brings the centre of mass right down. Now by having a very low centre of mass, it's very hard to topple this object. And because it's got such a wide base, this object, this candle, would have to move over a very large angle in order to fall. But other objects which would, would be considered unstable might be, if you think about uh, something which was like that. So if you had a plant pot which was like this. If this plant pot was filled, and especially if there's a plant on the top, the centre of mass might be rather high. And also, if you think about this, if as, it's cent as the centre of mass is high and the base is quite small, this would only have to move over a relatively small angle before Apologies, but never mind. This would only have to move over a relatively small angle before this came over this corner and that would mean it would topple. So in order to have a stable object we need a low centre of gravity and a wide base. An unstable object will have a, a narrow base and a, and a relatively high centre of gravity. Now, if we look at a beam, now this would be a much higher level question. Let's look at the forces acting on a beam and I'll try and keep this straightforward and show you alternative methods. So, we'll try this one. Let's consider a beam. Now before, when we talked about the centre of gravity, that was because every object would have a centre of gravity and in the case of a beam, it would be exactly in the centre. Now, so when we, if you had a beam and it had a uh, mass, you'd be able to work out its weight and you would know it always acts from exactly in the centre and you'd have to add that as an arrow facing downwards. Now in this case, I'm going to consider this is a, a weightless beam, again, because 
and then something slightly more complicated. I'm going to think of this beam as being supported by two points, A and B. And we'll say that they are two meters apart. And now we're going to say there's a box which is 20 newtons, or I should say 200 newtons. It's 200 newtons, however, it is 0 0.5 meters from there. So it's half a meter from there. So you've got two meters between them, and this is half a meter away. And what I want us to do is, I want us to realize what must be the force acting on there and there. And I'm going to do this in a really complicated manner at first, and then we'll look at an alternative. So, let's think about this. Obviously, the forces are not the same. We can't just say 200 divided by 2. They're not the same because this box is situated far closer to this pivot here. So if we use slightly complicated turning force maths, okay, we would say, let's take our turning forces about. Now I'm going to pick this point here. It would be exactly the same if you picked this point here. So I'm going to say, this box, which is a distance from this pivot, has a, has a force acting on it, that creates a clockwise turning force. So if you think about here, this creates a clockwise turning force pushing down. And that turn of force, moment equals force times distance, is 200 times a half, which is 100 newton meters. So there's a turning force of 100 newton meters pulling down here. So in order to balance, there must be a turning force pushed in the opposite direction. So there must be a turning force acting in this way. Now the turn of force acting in this way is provided by the other side. So if the green one, the clockwise turn of force, is 100 this way, the purple one, provided by this, is the anti-clockwise turn of force, and they must be equal. So we can say the anti-clockwise turn of force, which is provided by this force here, this force is the anti-clockwise. And you could say moment equals force times distance, the moment we know is 100, and that equals force times 2. So the force equals 100 divided by 2, which is 50 newtons. Okay? Now the next part of this, that was, but we were three marks, that. The last mark, the one mark question at the end would say, hence calculate the force here. This is very straightforward because we've worked out that this one here is 50 newtons, Therefore, if there's a force of 200 down, and there's a force of 50 here, this must be 150 newtons, because the total force down must equal the total force up. Okay? Now, we know that the answer is 50, and we know that this must be 150. An easier way to work this out, however, would be to see it as a ratio question. So that's the most complicated way to do it, but another way to do it would be to think of it as, if the block was there, the force here would be 200. If it was in the middle, it would be 100. And we can just split it, so it would be 200, 150. The force on here, 200 if the box was there. 150, 100, 50, zero. So instead of doing all the complicated maths, you could consider this as a simple ratios question, just divide the beam up. However, I think it's beneficial to be able to understand actually what's happening in terms of uh, turning forces. Okay?